Hello friends, if you're new here, my name is Marki Assad, a plastic surgery resident in the US and today I'm very excited to have a long time friend that I want to interview long time ago on my YouTube channel who recently matched into psychiatry, the superstar Manik Madan. Manik, welcome to the channel. Can you introduce yourself to our viewers? Hi guys, uh, welcome to Dr. Malki Assad's channel. My name is Manik. I am one of the PGY1 residents who just matched this year and I'm like right now in my intern year uh in psychiatry currently i'm going through my internal medicine rotation so yeah the us is a lot to digest so uh i think uh, in this video we'll be going over my journey and uh, dr malki will be dissecting it uh with me and giving his interesting insights about what he thinks so uh, i'm just going to give you a bit of a sample of what my cv was and this would be including both my scores and uh at the same time other experiences such as electives uh, research experiences and uh, at the same time we'll be talking about uh, you know what other parts like the era CV the interviews all all the quantity as well as the quality aspect of the game of USMLE. Awesome let's get started let's start with asking you about what when did you start developing interest in the uh, coming to the US and then how did you prepare for step one and step two CK I know you got phenomenal scores so tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, I I was interested in America because I always had that American dream as a kid. I would watch The Simpsons, you know, uh, all the American soap operas you can think of. And I was like, I just want to go to America, the land of the free. And just, you know, like it just gives you the opportunity to do whatever you want. And uh, even before going to med school, I was very much focused into like, you know, how can I go to America? And right when I entered like my med school, I got to know that there is this thing called the US family, the whole process of going to America to complete your residency, to practice there, which is just like mind blowing to me because, you know, like just having the chance to come to America, like, you know, which is probably the country with the most expertise in medicine and where a lot of medicine is actually made, right? Like published. I was just mind blown and uh, my seniors were giving their steps, step one, step two, and I got to learn from them. Uh, that what works and what doesn't work. Uh, I learned a lot from their mistakes, what not to use and what to use during the whole process. So, but the most, like just of the process, most of it started in, I think the third year when my senior was preparing for step one. So he told me about this resource called Kaplan. And I was like, okay. So at that time, Kaplan was a big deal. Everybody was like, do Kaplan, do Kaplan. It's it's just the best. Like people were buying the books and and they were like watching the videos. And I did that too. But what you would see with Kaplan is Kaplan tries to dissect uh, like different uh, topics into subjects, which is not really like goes towards the game of USMLE. USMLE is much more integrated and it's much more system based. For example, if you look at cardiology, right, they would ask you a question which will connect physiology, pharmacology, microbiology, and try to ask you questions which are not rather like memory oriented, but more cognitive process oriented testing your concepts and seeing how much you can think like you know your abstract thinking right how can you arrive at an answer by using different subjects and a good example i can give you and i, I give usually is for example if somebody is given uh, an antibiotic they're in the hospital they have cellulitis they're give, given an antibiotic and they just develop a diarrhea they wouldn't ask you what organism caused the diarrhea probably right they're going to give you the symptoms and they're going to be like okay this person developed this diarrhea they were given this medication it worked for them. What is the mechanism of action uh, of this medication? Is it a RNA polymerase inhibitor? It is, is it a like peptide wall? Uh, you know, like does it prevent the peptidoglycan wall synthesis, right? Any of this, those things. So the first one's probably fidoxamycin, second one's vancomycin. So like, as you could see here, we've connected different aspects of medicine. We've connected medicine, like the medical presentation with microbiology and uh, with uh, pharmacology and then biochemistry, right? So we went from different subject to different subject to different subject. And that is like really what makes USMLE so unique and different and like test your cognition, uh, which not everybody can do, right? I, I definitely understand that. So I was like, okay, what other resources can I use? And I just went on the internet, just on this whole search and I came across BUFAPS, right? So BUFAPS stands for Boards and Beyond uh, for the step one. This series is really good because it, like when you read first aid, Boards and Beyond like kind of explains first aid really well. And it will give you even more data because what first aid is like people like think it's the Bible of step one. It is a good review book, but it is it wouldn't itself give you concepts. It wouldn't itself 
integrate things for you right so for that you need boards and beyond and boards and beyond follows the format of first aid which is the best right so taking and like doing them hand in hand like would be very beneficial and i would definitely advise uh, to do that along with this i uh, so boards and beyond and fs or first aid and then we'll talk about uh, pathoma so pathoma is like great if you want to understand pathology which is again a majority of part of step 1 and i'll get into the detail of why step 1 is actually still important even though people think it's pass fail right it's like people think it's just like a pass game it, it's not like that uh then uh there's sketchy so sketchy stands for um it's picture mnemonics that people use and uh you get it for microbiology you get it for pharmacology and you also get it for pathology like micro and pharma are really good because it will try to like teach you to learn these micro things and these pharma things forever and it's linked with first aid too so that's a like, like a great connection system uh, along with this after you're done these things i think it's it's a good idea to start you well and why you need these things is 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 it like very important like people just want to get to you world really fast i wouldn't really advise that because what happens is if you just go to you world you will never develop question solving strategy by yourself you would always be like do i know the answer or do i not know the answer and based on that you will answer it you will never ask yourself okay i don't know the answer right now what clues or what patterns do i see here to eliminate everything else to come to the answer and the way you can do that is by first making sure you know things and then practicing a certain question and that's not you world right that's let's say uh, could be ambos or could be usmle rx which is by first aid itself and what that will teach you is how usmle makes questions out of content so rx does a really good job because it's by first aid and they will give you references of everything and you will be like i knew pulmonary embolism but you really didn't when you do the question right so it would teach you how pulmonary embolism presents at the same time it would teach you right how to answer questions what is elimination if you don't know the answer how to kind of come to the answer right and then you go to you world to practice the, those questions like you know your question taking skills to calibrate them and that will make everything way easier now you'll be like manik step one fast fail why should i do that right the reason is because step 2 is still not pass fail and what makes about 60% of step 2 is step 1 right what is step 2 step 2 is just one step ahead of step 1 so if you think about it like in a ladder model step 2 just adds to the complexity of step 1 so they'll give you a question about step 1 they'll just make it more complex and clinically more oriented and make you answer that right if you don't have the fundamental basics of step 1 you never studied for it really well well step 2 is going to take a big hit because of that right so that's why i would really advocate prepare well for step 1 i know it's pass fail but that shouldn't mean that you should just you know just half as it or like just go go past it like definitely don't do that and a lot of people are failing right now if you see that like compared to before number one because they've improved they have increased the passing score and secondly people are not taking it seriously they're like we can just do you know half you world and just go and pass that doesn't really work like that step 1 is a hard exam uh even if it's past it right after that like you know after i was done with my step 1 which was during my 5th year of medical school um uh, i started preparing for step 2 it took time because i was doing a job and for step 2 what i would like really like go, go for i think that really works is just you world and an amboss combination the reason like you want to just do you world is if your step 1 foundation is strong you don't really need a lot of other books because it's just going to distract you because here less is more the less you do here the less complexity you get in the more you're going to score right because the more you're going to focus on you world so focus on you world and add amboss library with it because i i even give examples of this you world doesn't always explain everything which is a big problem and amboss library kind of does so let's say if you got a question on cord equina versus conus medialis and you were like you will did not give me the proper explanation to differentiate between these you can just go to amboss library type conus medialis or cord equina and you will get a whole table telling you the main differences between those two and that's how i learned the main differences for example conus medialis medialis syndrome is upper motor neuron and cord equina is lower motor neuron conus medialis tends to be bilateral uh cord equina tends to be unilateral like i know this because i've done that from amboss and it will really uh complement your preparation with you world and i think that's all you need there's divine intervention podcast if you just want to revise certain topics and add more to your score so that that's a great resource but all in all these three resources should suffice if you add, want to add like a video series boards and beyond still is there for step to ck however still like the less you do here the more, the more you're going to get 
and again emphasizing the uh, step one importance so this led to like you know my step one scores of 260 and then step two seeking score of 271 right and uh, okay so that's the score part right and and you know like a lot of imgs and i think because our mentality is like this we focus all the time on scores and america you will understand like when you go into a system like university system like upmc or let's like, say penn state or other places program directors truly don't care about scores like above a certain level like they're like 240 above is good enough and the reason for that is this right what happens is a lot of the times when people score really high they don't have the like vocational skills they don't have the verbal skills to even communicate with the patient to have charisma to be funny and that is what like being a doctor is about if you cannot communicate with the patient if the patients are not comfortable with you right less your english english is not uh, diverse in its grammar. You, you cannot communicate different frames of your emotion in different ways, right? But like, at least you, you, you cannot, like you can communicate hard news without offending the patient or without scaring them, right? That's important. A lot of people just cannot do that. And that's very apparent in interviews. And that's why interviews matter the most, because at the end, medicine is about communication, not just about your skills, right? And that's where we go wrong. And we never prepare for interviews and we just show up. And that's why people like don't get ranked, even with 260s and 270s. I 100% agree with you on this point because I've seen so many applicants with super high scores, but medicine is different. It's not about scores. They don't get interviews sometimes. They get interviews, but they don't match because now you match in residency and you see life is not a step one exam or step two CK exam. Having the knowledge prepares you, but it's totally different than real life scenarios and patient interactions and communications and the other things you do in the hospital, right? Yeah. And a lot of the times, let's say, even if you don't know the treatment of certain disorder, you can just go to up, up to date and just look it up. Right. So you would see this here that they actually do sometimes give preferences to uh, American graduates and like, uh, you know, uh, any kind of MDs or DOs because they are better communicators, because they know that they, they don't have to worry about that aspect. Right. Because they'll be able to like get well along with other people. So that's a big problem that you need to solve for yourself. And that doesn't mean like that is unfair. I do understand that. But you can do a lot of things to get it in your favor, right? Compared to other people. So what did you do? So you, after you're done with step one, step two CK, what are the other things you worked on to match at a great program such as Penn State and improve your chance of matching? So uh, one of the first things I did was like work experiences. I have four work experiences. Since I graduated, they are not electives or sub-internships. I wish they were, uh, and I would definitely advocate for them. Uh, but I could only get externships, which are hands-on. But I did four months of intense externships, which generated really great LORs, I believe, which like all my LOR writers just like put in my era CV. So I think that that's something that helped a lot because a lot of programs were like, oh my God, your LOR is a stellar right i don't believe this you, you've got to talk to me in the interview to just prove these things right so that happened uh secondly what came in like real handy and first of all regarding work experiences right please do electives and you know the most important uh electives out of all are sub internships which a lot of people don't even know about so what is a sub internship and how can you get one so like i'll compare like electives from other other uh, kind of rotations so there's in general sub internships which are the highest levels of electives then there's electives right and like clerkships the second name for that and third one is externships and then the last would be observerships so first of all what uh, is a sub internship so sub internship is you performing in a certain uh, like specialty in a program where you're performing as an intern or a PGY1 resident. And why is that important? Because when you are like responsible for direct patient care, you're literally dispensing the medications, you're taking care of their BP, fluids, and all of those things, that gives the LOR writer the chance to write great things about you because you performed at that level, right? You, you were given responsibility and you, per you performed. So that would lead to a LOR that's far better than what you can get with any of those rotations. So understand that sub internships, like you take care of at least four patients every day, and that gives them the chance to actually evaluate your clinical skills, write great examples about you, right? Which other people can talk about. Secondly, it would be electives, which you can only do on like at an undergraduate level, right? Again, they're uh, not that hard to get. Get your school enrolled in VSLO, which is visiting student uh, learning opportunities, or you can go through non-VSLO, right? It's better to go with like some like rotations where you can apply directly, right? Either through VSLO or non-VSLO. 
than with companies uh, because like there is a problem like companies aren't bad but you, what you have to understand is companies a lot of the times place you in outpatient clinics which nobody cares about because in outpatient clinics you are not seeing integration of medicine for example if i'm working in psych consult like in psychiatry i would see patients with delirium in the ed and like you know with a med- medical problem and i would address that right you know let's say even in primary care let's say uh, medicine if somebody has delirium they would consult psych so you would see that integration of different specialties where you would open up the emr cerner or it be epic and you would see like their whole history and then you would address that right outpatient you won't get any of that so there's not a lot of great things to write about it too so please understand that so it's better to like apply directly then go through agencies if that's not possible agencies are okay but try to leave, like you know leave on the side uh, thirdly would be externships if you've graduated you have no option right hands on experience externships are the best because they allow you to interact with the patient last would be observerships right but observerships aren't the best because you are literally shadowing the doctor you're not allowed to even talk to the patient let alone take history or dispense medications right or put notes in the emr so please remember that sub internships electives externships and then uh, i would do observerships okay so that's about it uh, now let's talk about research experience and why research experience matters so i don't have a big like a uh, long research experience i only have 2 months uh, compared to you or <laughs> you're like 3 years or something and research experience is important because number 1 uh when you do research experience it builds connections it builds a network which is i think the most powerful thing out of a research experience because when you work under a pi who's famous or like who people know they're going to put in a good word for you every single where and i'm telling you in america a good word goes like by by a person who's trust, trusted by everyone goes far ahead compared to scores because again everybody can score that high right 260s to 70s a lot of people can but not everybody can get that person to vouch for them right and if you've done that you've done something special and that's when you get access to let's say very competitive specialties such as plastic surgery uh, such as uh, dermatology or surgery right and a lot of people do that so highly advocate for research experience you've already made a video on that and we have also made a video on that you just need to have a few bit of a research cv publish case reports by yourself learn research and then apply right and they they would even pay you if you're good enough right so you can even generate money to apply for the match in case money is an issue so i did research experience for 2 months and i had publications i think uh two were published in like index in pubmed two weren't uh so they also had like cuz they were brought in especially if you interview in universities they would definitely bring it up like if it's a community program they, they really don't care about these things but if it's a university cuz it helps right if you can publish right who who are you going to publish under them and if you publish under them who's h index who's going to high <laughs> go high there's right so that's why they are going to rank you higher if you have research experience or publications so i had both like i had to like uh tick those boxes for myself also uh, lastly would be volunteer experience i had volunteer experience i wouldn't say it's like going to make the difference for you but like it does help like when you are talking in the interview right because it, it interviews everything so volunteer experience for example if you've done anything in med school for free i've taken part in like spreading awareness about aids through dance kits which i talked about like people and, and like even hosted a comedy show where i got made fun of so that was a, like a funny point Uh, to talk about and like made people laugh i think that helped so get all these boxes ticked for you and it's better like not to leave any box unticked cuz you're competing with a lot of people right especially if you're applying for a competitive specialty or a good program such as a university program right so that's what i would say lastly so era cv is when all of this comes together your personal statement and uh you know your lor everything else make sure all of them is like well written because whenever these people are going through these like they are going through thousands of applications and if they see a grammatical error that that really pisses them off so please don't do those those things if you have to get it edited right get it edited you can pay somebody or if you know somebody who's like your senior who's willing to do it for free get that done there right it's up to you uh just please make sure it's good right it's grammatically correct and clear in its meaning and simple right uh now uh, we are going to talk about interviews and what i want you to know about interviews is you assembly scores and all this cv experience is a means to an end right people like what they will do is they'll focus all of their energy on freaking like these 
mean goals, which is your USMLE scores and ERA CV, but they wouldn't have any experience on how to do like, you know, an interview, a proper interview, right? But understand that interview is what makes or breaks it. it it's what gets you the residency, not your scores or your ERA CV. And why is that? Because a lot of things can be faked along the journey. I, I definitely understand that. A lot of people write their own LORs. I know that. A lot of people, uh, you know, and LOR would never be negative, right? It could be specific or it could be non-specific. It's always generally positive. So a lot of things can be faked, right? Your ERA CV can be faked. A lot of experiences can be faked. But what cannot be faked is when you're in front of them on the freaking camera or like you're in front of them during the interview. The way you talk would clarify everything for them. And that's why everybody prefers the interview because you are live in person and this is live feedback. This is live. Like they'll know the truth. If you've ever told a, a lie, they would know that because they've interviewed thousands of people. And that's why interviews matter the most, right? And when you interview, everybody's at an equal level fee, uh, playing field not considering visas because that's the other thing. If you are a US applicant, that's a different thing, right? But if you're an IMG, everybody's on a level playing field uh, and interviewing makes the whole difference. Just know your answers. Don't like basic stuff. Like, you know, tell me about yourself. Just have a 60 second or 90 second answer, which like in a bulleted form, which you can improvise like on. So that's better. So any question that can be asked, just Google it, you know, uh, in common interview questions for residents. If you want to do an interview course, definitely go ahead with that. It's all up to you, whatever your budget allows. But do prepare for interviews. Don't take them jokingly. And I can certainly relate because I tried to. Because when during my first interview, I was just like, what the hell? Because if you're an IMG, you've never experienced this, right? And when you go through this, all of them would act nice to your face. But trust me, behind the board, they're ranking you with other people. People are criticizing you. So make sure that you don't get criticized on at least basic things, right? It's okay to get criticized on advanced, like let's say like some advanced thing, but on basic answers, you should not screw up on and like that at least wouldn't take you out of the game. And lastly, you know, rank order list gets formed and I think that's how the match happens. I got matched into Penn State, which is a university program. And I'll go into like detail about how university programs are actually like really good when you compare it to other like programs because, um, like what people don't understand is in university programs, they at least, they, they really care about your didactics and they want to teach you. While in community programs, it's much more about developing the clinical care, right? So if you're getting into a university program, it's, it's almost always non-malignant and it's almost always very education focused and they're just not using you to take care of patients. While community programs sometimes can do that, not all of them do, but most of it is more clinical care than education or research. So like, you know, all of this, like if you invest in this, getting into a university program will just <laughs> make you happy in the end. Trust me. <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Awesome. That was a very comprehensive overview of the whole process. I couldn't have summarized it better. Uh, you talked about the USMLE and I totally agree with you. Scores matter to a point and afterwards it becomes your overall CV. And that's what I feel that IMGs don't understand is that they study for two and three years for an exam and they have nothing else on their CV and they apply and they get shocked that they didn't match because they have two 60s and two 70s on their CV. You have to understand as an applicant, it's way more than just uh, your step one or step two CK score. And I also agree with the idea that you mentioned about uh, preparing for step one, even if it's uh, pass fail and I mentioned that in my step one pass fail video how preparing well on the step one will help first guarantee that you pass and you don't fail which, which would be a disaster but second it would set you apart from other applicants when you're going for the step two because you already have a good base and you won't spend so much time studying for step two. I also agree with you about the idea of research how it's important to connect uh, with mentors and we have made multiple videos about uh, research uh, me and you we made a video about that i have a detailed research course on how to do research how to uh, publish a paper how to do statistical analysis how to find research positions i know this whole process is not easy to do and i have a detailed course on how to find research positions and finally the interviews 100 percent agree with you that we as img specifically we got into med school we got into schools without a formal interview process here, all American applicants, if they go into college, they interview. If they go into med school, they interview. So they're already prepared for that. So if you are an IMG specifically, you haven't done much interviews, I definitely, definitely recommend you do it with someone experienced. And don't just do it with your co-residents, co-applicants, because they also might not know what is the ideal way to interview. So I prepared multiple blogs on interviews. I'm preparing a series on interviews and I'll leave the links 
for our interview preparation packages for the videos for the blogs in the description below Manik, that was an amazing interview. Before we end, I just want a few minutes to tell us about your experience in residency. Take us through a day in the life of Manik Madan as a psychiatry resident. So right now, the funny part is, even though I'm a psych resident, I haven't done a single psych rotation. <laughs> uh, what I'm doing right now is internal medicine, and that I'm doing at UPMC Harrisburg. So we do it there because uh, the experience is better uh, for us. Uh, so my day actually starts at about 4.30, which I know is way too early. The reason that is, is because like UPMC itself is very far away from me. So I have to get up early, get ready and reach there by 5.30. And the reason you do that is because of the sign out, because the sign out happens about at 5.30 or 6. So uh, I get the sign out at 5.30 and 6. Um, and then like with my team, so that we have a team, uh, I work with team C and we have a like a cap of 16 patients and two interns. Like So the team's made of two interns. Uh, one second year and one third year, right, to supervise you. So you as an intern take half the patients so out of 16. I take eight patients every day. And my co-intern also takes eight patients. And then our seniors take uh, eight and eight, right? So second year would take eight patients and the third year would take eight patients. And we would communicate about their care, right? So at a time, a, a patient has two residents taking care of them and an attending who who supervises all of us, right? And it's, it's a lot of fun because, uh, you know, like, I did not know how Cerner worked. I did not know how Epic worked. Now I know how that works. And I think good quality rotations actually teach you that versus going for a rotation that is just an observership. I, I can totally understand why they would actually prefer. Like, haven't you seen that when you do your uh, PGY1 and PGY2, you can see why they prefer like US candidates because they just have, know the I system. I agree. I see the PGY, uh, sorry, the med students in their third year and fourth year, they're functioning on a level as a resident. I was like, oh my gosh, now I can see why they prefer an American student yeah. because they're used to the system. Where are the results in Cerner or Epic? You're like, where are they? You're asking medical students. And I can understand that like now that why there is this preference because it's just easier to train them because they know the system. Right. So even like if you see uh, like at universities, what they would do is they would take their own students because they just know the system. Right. As a program director, what do I want? An easy life. I don't want to get headaches over somebody. Right. Know the qualities of these people. Like you know them as people. So you interacted with them. You see that they're nice. They don't cause problems. So regardless of their clinical skills, you know them personally and you're more likely to pick someone you know versus someone you don't know. Yeah, and it's a bias and it's an unfair advantage. I definitely understand that. But you could like definitely play against this game if you want to by getting research experience, by getting to know people who could say good things about you, who are like, you know, really famous in their field. So just know that, yes, it's unfair. But again, life is unfair, right? Like people talk about, okay, USM is unfair. This Life is unfair, man. <laughs> like if you look at life, not everybody's born with the equal advantages or disadvantages. Just understand that. Play a game where you win by trying to stack your own advantages uh, is what I would say. Do your rotations, do research experience, whatever it takes. But I, I can definitely see that. So after that, like during like the whole day, so it starts at like 5.30 and then we have like a lunch break at 12. Uh, like, and by this time, we would have discussed all the cases with the attending and like put in the orders for the patient, looked at the all the imaging and stuff and communicated what, 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 like the management plan, right? So what, what are we going to do with the patient? At 12, we have lunch. So our residency like provides us lunch for free and you just get to eat good food, right? And uh, after this is just uh, working, working, working till four. So residency is hectic. It, it's not as easy as a lot of people would believe. So you work till four or five. Sometimes it's even longer because let's say if a patient gets serious, you're responsible for the patient. You can't leave at just four, right? Because that patient's your responsibility. So you're going to stay till five or six a lot of the times. Uh, just to take care of patients, and, and and I've learned that, right? So, and you would also see, like, you know, I, I think about like U.S. medical students. So a lot of uh, people from different uh, universities come to do audition rotations at UPMC. And what you would see is these students have calls. <laughs> these students are doing sub internships. They have calls, right? They're performing at my level. They would present so clearly, but sometimes even better than me. And I wouldn't lie, right? And fourthly, what you would see is. They stay till four or five, like the same time as me. And that, like now it makes sense really like why a program director sometimes would prefer that because if you've seen somebody do that, right, and perform at a residence level, you would definitely pick that person because you have clear evidence of their performance, right, versus a subjective LOR, like uh, of a person who nobody knows. 
I understand that. Like, and you would do that. Like, once you go through the residency process, like, I think everybody would understand why is there that bias, right? Like, people talk about. So that was an interesting observation. I'm like, I think you know that that I wouldn't have realized if I hadn't gone in, into residency. Malik, you are a role model for so many IMGs. Thank you so much for this video. Any final advice for these people listening to you, uh, trying to start the USMLE journey or their midway or already match? Any advice for these applicants? So my biggest advice for everyone would be life isn't fair. Stop talking about like if somebody scores high, you don't. Well, what else can you do to like boost up your CV and make your chances better, right? And that could be research, learn research skills. Even knowing those skills can help you everywhere in like getting a research like job. And that could take you like far in the game than compared to just scores. And please know that like not, I understand not everybody can score that well, but there are so many advantages on your side that you can play and stop like procrastinating. Okay, I didn't score that well. It's over for me. Or would 230 get me into this program? Please stop doing that. Everybody has their own story. Play the best game you can because it's poker. It's not the best hand that wins is the man who plays the best hand. I think that's that that's what it is, right? Just try to get all the advantages on your side. Prepare for interviews, prepare for everything in advance and make sure you don't miss out on at least the basics. Everybody like, even I screwed my interviews sometimes because, you know, with some answers and I definitely understand if that happens. But if you know the basics well, it they will carry you through, right? And in the end, just you will match. Don't worry about it. Just play the right game. You will match. Thank you so much, man. That was an extremely insightful interview. I really appreciate all your time and advice. And I know that you're tomorrow on call. So I appreciate doing this late in the night and uh, good luck on your residency. Definitely. Thank you so much for your time too. Take care. Of course. For our viewers, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below or feel free to reach out to us by email info at magicguy.com, my Instagram or Twitter at Malik Asad or my Facebook page Malik Asad MD. And I'll also leave Malik Madan's handles in the description below. If you need any help with your USMLE, personal statements, CV, interview preparation or research, make sure to check out the services and courses we provide for residency applicants and I'll leave all the links in the description below. Thank you again so much for watching and see you in future videos.